Welcome to another episode of the Rational Standard Podcast. Uh, today I'm very happy to welcome our guest, another member of Parliament on the podcast. She's what an honour it is to have someone. He's also one of my personal favourite MPs when it comes to his Twitter feed. Uh, please welcome uh, Michael Cardo, MP. Michael, how's it going on your side? How's it, Nick? Very well in yourself. Very, very good. Uh, so, I have known you really just uh, through sort of my libertarian circles. I a little while ago, I asked people, like, what members of the DA in Parliament are, are sort of on our side of things? And one of the names that was put up was, was Michael Cardo, and that's when I discovered you actually through Twitter. You seem to be one yeah. of the more feisty MPs on Twitter, uh, which I've quite enjoyed. Uh, but let's start off. I always like my guests to just introduce themselves a bit. So, so tell us a bit about yourself, uh, how you got involved in uh, politics and, and eventually became an MP. Sure. Well, I've actually been working with the uh, Democratic Alliance for quite a long time. Um, I got involved with the party in around about 2003, in fact, just in the run-up to the 2004 election, and I started off as a, a political staffer, um, working as a researcher and assistant speechwriter. And so I've been involved with the party for a number of years uh, in a staffing capacity. Uh, I worked as uh, Helen Zillis speechwriter on the 2009 election campaign and then when we uh, won the province in that year I went off uh, to work in the Western Cape government in the policy unit located in the Premier's office and in around about 2013 I started thinking well I've been a staff member for quite some time I wonder what it would be like to actually throw my hat in the ring to be a public representative, and that's why I ran for Parliament in 2014, uh, got elected on the uh, Western Cape List to National Parliament, and have been serving in the National Legislature since then. Uh, my initial portfolio was as a deputy on the presidency, and now I am uh, the party's fellow uh, spokesperson on economic development. I see. Well, thank you very much for that, uh, showing us how you eventually became an MP. And, and do you mind if I ask, um, why the DA? Uh, people seem to have different stories about how they sort of came to the party that they had. Uh, sometimes it's through student politics. Uh, but what was it in your case? Yeah, well, I've always been a, a DP, DA supporter. Uh, I haven't voted for any other party. I suppose my interest really... Uh, came about through a kind of uh, intellectual slash ideological um, commitment to liberal ideas and values. So I'm very interested in the, the history of the South African political liberal tradition. And in fact, before I started working for the DA, I had almost started on course uh, for a career as an academic. And my background is in uh, political history. So I'm interested in uh, liberal ideas and how they manifest themselves in the political marketplace. And I suppose I was drawn to the DA because for me, as parties went on the South African political scene, it was the one party for me that most closely embodied the ideals which I subscribed to. Uh, around uh, individual freedom, for one thing. So, I mean, it's the kind of greatest, greatest motivator of my liberalism as a core belief in, in individual freedom, I suppose. I have a real deep and visceral aversion to groupthink and authoritarianism, which knit together quite well in, in contemporary identity politics. So, the DA for me represented a party that stood for you know, freedom from tyranny freedom from too much state control, too much state interference, and a party that really stood uh, for the best values and traditions in South African liberalism. Well, that's, you know, it's interesting to hear this because we often talk about this sort of early days of the DA from the late 90s to the sort of early to mid 2000s. And, uh, you know, I'm afraid to say that a lot of people in the sort of libertarian classical liberal circles have 
become a little bit disillusioned uh, as a result, and uh, perhaps we can get into this, and you can tell me whether you think that's justified or not, but I'm going to start off by uh, drawing reference to, there was a, uh, a picture shared on Twitter by someone of an old DP election poster, uh, which had the slogan, less government, more freedom. Uh, right. And I think to many of us these days, uh, if we tr associate the DA with this sort of uh, minimal government uh, sort of a slogan, it just seems so foreign. So w what happened to the party ideologically, or are we just being silly and the, the party still retains that, it actually still retains that sort of classical liberal streak? What do you think? I think that the party does retain a liberal core. Um, I think it's inevitable that as the party grows, there may be a dilution of that core. And I think there's a danger, you know, in looking back at past DP posters of imagining something that was pure and pristine. You know, Tony Leon has a great line in his um, memoirs, and he says something along the lines of the fact that the DA uh, or the DP, was never a pristine political priesthood. So I think there's a danger and a temptation of idealizing that which uh, the DP was. Uh, and then, of course, one must be pragmatic too um, in the electoral marketplace uh, within which we operate. Um, frankly, a kind of, you know, minimal government message and banging that drum relentlessly is only going to get you so far. So I think that for a party to successfully challenge the ANC, um, a hegemonic ruling party, the party of liberation that enjoys still even 25 years after uh, messing up the country, an enormous amount of goodwill, you're going to have to broaden your message and broaden your appeal. And frankly, kind of uh, playing the libertarian card um, won't cut it in the broader South African electoral marketplace. Um, but having said that, I uh, do think that the DA uh, retains uh, certain core liberal values. Uh, the party has translated those values in recent years in the language of uh, freedom, fairness, opportunity and diversity. And to answer your question succinctly, I suppose, is that in order to grow, we have to make ourselves as attractive as possible and become something of a broad church, if you like. That does seem to be, in my opinion at least, and I'm, I'm sure you express some of the sentiments, what the DA kind of looks like today. Uh, you know, I always am very interested to compare various uh, DA MPs' tweets. I know this is just Twitter and there's not a whole lot of substance on Twitter. Uh, but you compare someone like uh, Pumzila van Dam uh, to someone like Gwen and Gwenya, although Gwen has recently just joined you guys. Uh, they seem to me to be worlds apart. And on one hand, that's not such a bad thing. I, I quite enjoy countries where there's a lot of uh, ideological diversity within parties, like the United States. You have people like Rand Paul and Lindsey Graham in one Republican party. But, yes. the, but the difference in South Africa is that we have a proportional representation system. So in the next election, I vote for a party and, and not a person. Uh, mm. Now, in my estimation, this is where there's a bit of a danger in, in sort of the broad church idea, is that I, I've always felt like South African politics has become intensely partisan to the point of almost parties being like a cult of personality. It's like, what is your opinion? My opinion is the party's opinion. It's like, well, that just seems so strange, you know? <laughs> is, that really, yeah. is, that, is, that, is that really true? Um, so, you know, on, on that topic, perhaps you can comment about that and, and where you think that's, that's a good or a bad thing to have party unity uh, versus, uh, you know, more differing views on, on things. But is there a bit of a swimming upstream against the ideological currents in order to keep the liberal values these days? Or again, are we uh, worrying about nothing? Well, look, I suppose I would answer your question by saying that there's a spectrum of liberalism in the DA. And there is a spectrum of people who would uh, regard themselves and self-identify as liberals. Uh, and certainly, I'm sure there are, are some members and some voters of the DA 
who couldn't care less either way. I mean, they vote for the DA because it's a strong opposition to the ANC or because it's better at delivering services. So you know, not everyone is an ideologue or particularly interested in ideological debates. Uh, and I think that it is a useful thing to have within a party, uh, among people who regard themselves as liberals, a spectrum of views. I think that's actually quite a healthy thing um, because it promotes a uh, competition of ideas and it promotes a culture of healthy and robust debate. Um, where I would start to get concerned or worry is when that culture of healthy, robust debate is frowned upon or attempts are made to quash it. And it's certainly not been my experience in the DA of that ever happening to me, uh, certainly not personally. The, the, the concern I, I have is sometimes when I see MPs, one MP says X, and then others are sort of forced to pick up the pieces on their behalf. Because, you know, if, if you get what I'm saying when I say because you're all in one party and, yeah. and voters vote for the party instead of the individual, it's like you've got to toe the party line. And I think a classic example of this was uh, Helen Zilla's tweets. I know that what the public mostly saw was uh, the leader, Musi Maimane, speaking out against it. And, you know, there was a whole thing. She flew up to Joburg. But then you had guys like Sihlen Gobese, who's very much on the libertarian side of things in the Western Cape government, on a, on a totally opposite spectrum. And, uh, you know, that's just the, the part which, which bothers me, is it's like, it, it seems, at least seems to me, like if you put a toe out of line on, on certain things like that, particularly with regards to sensitive topics where you have to really hold face, uh, you get nailed. Uh, what do you think about that? I understand. I mean, one shouldn't underestimate uh, the degree to which social media in general and Twitter in particular um, has changed the complexion of things when it comes to self-expression. Um, so, you know, I think it's entirely possible that 10 years ago there may have been a multiplicity of opinions among uh, public representatives in the DA on any given topic. It's just that, you know, Twitter wasn't there as an outlet to share those views with the world. So I think all of these things have to be carefully balanced against one another. You know, obviously every single po political party uh, needs to convey a message with clarity and coherence. And it cannot be that any old public representative kind of, you know, puts up their hand and says something which may jeopardize the clarity and coherence of that message. So that I completely get. Um, but at the same time, you don't want to discourage and dissuade people from engaging in a positive, healthy debate around substantive issues. So, for example, uh, the question of black economic empowerment, uh, for example, is one where people in the DA may have different ideas about whether BE is working uh, or whether we need to move away from a uh, race-based model of redress, whether we need to move away from this notion that um, race is a proxy for disadvantage. I think it's possibly, it's perfectly possible to have healthy discussions around those issues within a party without them being detrimental to the party as a whole. Well, I like that attitude. Uh, I think it certainly should lead itself to uh, an era of ideology being improved over time as the bad ones sort of come out into the open. Um, yeah. You mentioned BEE there. I'm interested just to briefly talk about that. Can I just ask you, you personally now, what is your views uh, on BE in South Africa, what it is versus what it should be, or should there be none of it at all? Right. Well, look, I mean, I should say at the outset that I am certainly not a hardcore uh, libertarian who believes that there is no role for the state in society. You know, 
I am of the view that South Africa has a particular history of uh, racial dispossession, uh, disenfranchisement, uh, and inequality bequeathed by apartheid, which was a system that was legislatively enacted. And I do see the need for the state to play some role in redressing that legacy bequeathed by apartheid and having a certain awareness of the complex set of racial dynamics that we have inherited because of that past. Also, I'm very cognizant of uh, Section 92 of the Constitution, uh, which enables the state to take certain proactive measures to uh, redress the inequalities of the past. So I'm certainly not against affirmative action in principle. My point of view where BEE is concerned is that it has now become abundantly clear in a way that perhaps wasn't abundantly clear uh, in 2009, but certainly is after uh, nine years of Jacob Zuma being in power, after state capture, that BEE is a failed policy. Basically, it's a get-rich-quick scheme designed to benefit the ANC's cronies. And I think any political party, and in fact any civil society organisation that has an interest in public policy and policy making needs to understand and analyse uh, why BEE has failed and to present a clear alternative. And when you are the official opposition, I think the onus upon you to present a clear alternative is even heavier because you want something clear and distinctive that puts the so-called clear blue water between you and uh, your opponent. So I think it's a very positive thing that the DA is re-looking at uh, black economic empowerment, and I'm looking forward to uh, what emerges from the uh, policy review process that's being headed up by Gwen and Gwenya, and which will go to the Federal Council in October for consideration. Oh, okay. Well, I, I was uh, personally not aware quite that that was uh, under... Uh, examination, but I'm very interested to see what comes out. I've for long been a big fan of Gwen and Gwenya, so I suppose I'll wait till October <laughs> and see. Uh, but moving from uh, one issue to another, uh, you know, the thing on everybody in South Africa's minds at the moment is I think the land issue. This has uh, been the talk of our politics for the past uh, couple of months, basically ever since Cyril Ramaphosa became president. Um, and, and I'll be honest, I've spoken to some friends of mine, and I think, uh, you know, for some people, certainly me, next election is going to be very pivotal. Uh, mm. It seems to me like next election is going to determine whether or not South Africans want to have property rights. Uh, f first of all, I just want to ask you, as someone who's on the ground there as an MP, do you think it's at all conceivable that we could see an amendment of the Constitution before next year's election, or are there just not the votes for it at the moment? I think it's highly unlikely. Um, look, I think the ANC would want it, uh, and the EFF will certainly be pushing for it. But I think it is likely to be a fairly complex and involved process, um, and I'm not sure that the ANC is going to be able to wrap it up before March next year, which is when I imagine Parliament will rise in order for us to go into uh, election mode on ground. I think we're probably looking at a May election. That's certainly the word on the street. Uh, and that's what the IAC, or the Electoral Commission rather, has indicated uh, will in all likelihood happen. And if it does, then Parliament will probably rise in March. Now, bear in mind that we go into recess uh, at the end of November beginning of December, and we'll only meet again to the State of the Nation in February. So all of which is to say that time is not on the ANC's side. So I personally would be quite surprised if the ANC 
uh, manages successfully to amend the constitution uh, to change section 25 and uh, enable expropriation without compensation before March next year. Right. And, you know, to wit, that means that really what's going to determine whether or not it will happen, at least it seems like this to me, is how many parties who are in favor of amending the constitution to allow for expropriation without compensation uh, get new seats at the end of next year's election. Uh, now, you know, to me, uh, based on my knowledge of politics and economics and everything, I have no idea how a country can really function without property rights. And as a result, this is very much a one-issue election for me. To me, this is, is going to be the defining factor. Um, and I'm going to come a little bit critical on the DA again. Uh, again, myself and a lot of people in our circles have been rather disappointed at the sort of reaction we've gotten. Although... In speaking to people uh, within the party, it does sound a lot like you guys are very much pro-property rights. So let me first just ask you, just to get some clarity, the DA's position on this uh, is what exactly? Well, we certainly uh, reject expropriation without compensation. We reject amending Section 25 of the Constitution. And we reject any abrogation of property rights. Um, you know, you will appreciate that Fantastic. Property, property <laughs> rights are absolutely fundamental to a democracy. You know, they're the, the foundation upon which the edifice is built in some measure. And I think it's fair to say of the, ANC, of the DA that where we are in government, we, we focus obsessively on title deed reform, um, you know, making real homeowners of uh, those recipients of state-subsidized housing who have until now not had actual ownership of the homes they live in. So the DA is 100% committed to property rights. It's 100% committed to title deed reform. It's 100% committed to making people owners of the homes they live in. So this then sort of begs the question, uh in my opinion, the DA's reaction to the initial start about talking about expropriation without compensation was rather lackluster. I remember seeing Musi Maimane speak in Parliament, or I can't remember if it, was, if it was a quote from his speech in Parliament or just on a press release, where the thing that was said was, expropriation without compensation uh, is not suitable for a growing economy, or something along those lines. And I just thought, well, it's like, you know, it's a lot worse than that. It can also be completely and utterly disastrous from an economic uh, and, and a point of view of people who have been oppressed for decades and centuries who could not lo own land under apartheid may still not be able to own land because we will have no property rights. It's like you could just go on to this thing forever and ever. And uh, I, I've personally felt like I, the DA's reaction to this has been a bit lackluster in the face of, to use an example, COPE, who have taken this by the horns, and I think they're going to increase their vote share next year. Uh, so, again, would you, you know, am I being unreasonable here, or is this, again, part of a more of an electoral strategy? It just sort of seems to me that the DA should really be selling this a bit more, and it kind of appears to them that it's like a bit of a soft point, and it's a bit of a something that you guys don't want to touch so much. Yeah. Look, I'm not aware of that. Um, you know, as far as I'm concerned, um, it's clear to me that there is, as I said previously, a total commitment to property rights and a fairly profound understanding of how tampering with uh, the current constitutional dispensation on property rights, what a, a ruinous and disastrous impact that would have. And I think it's fair to say of the DA that um, where we are in government, uh, in cities, and certainly here in the West and the Cape, we have made a um, great show of pointing to the successes we enjoyed with our own land reform uh, initiatives. And I think maybe what it's not always easy to get across to an ordinary member of the public is that it is perfectly possible to support land reform but 
to reject expropriation without compensation. Um, and in fact, you know, this is something that even sensible people with the ANC realize, if you look at uh, the Khalil Mutfanti high-level panel report, is that it's perfectly possible to um, believe in those two things at the same time. In other words, to support land reform, but to reject expropriation without compensation. So imagine what you'll see going into the election is the party hammering quite hard on the fact that we support tight deed reform, that we support land reform initiatives within the uh, current constitutional framework, and that we actively reject any attempts to tamper with what was a very finely balanced and very carefully thought through segment that gave us Section 25 in the first place. Do you think that the role in civil society, that civil society in South Africa has had, has been a positive or negative one? Of course, certain groups, and I'll wait till we get to them before I name them, uh, have come under fire for this by members of your party. Um, but, but again, the reason I bring this up is because groups like AfriForum uh, and others seem to be, to a lot of people, particularly in some cases the farming community, more of an ally in this fight. It's a really big ideological fight. Uh, Institute of Race Relations is another one I would aim. I think Franz Cunier gave a, a brilliant talk um, ab about this issue. And they're really taking this one, uh, you know, by the horns. And they're really making this a priority issue. I mean, uh, what, what, what do your comment be on, on the discourse that's going on there? Yeah, look, I think the Institute of Race Relations has done great work on uh, land stuff. Uh, and certainly the message uh, resonates with me and with uh, many people within the DA. So to answer your question, I think that the impact of NGOs and civil society on the land debate has been broadly quite positive. Um, if you're referring to the submissions that we heard in Parliament uh, a month or so ago, um, you know, I think that an NGO like the Helen Susan Foundation, for example, was uh, treated appallingly. You know, they came along, their three submissioners were kind of dismissed as, you know, three old men, and the memory of Hen Sussman was maligned. But if you're looking for something entirely positive out of the public uh, participation process, um, you know, I think that's probably a little misguided because it's, it's been a farce the whole way along. Um, you mentioned Afri Forum. Look, you know, I can't bring myself to join the chorus of condemnation and finger-wagging that followed uh, uh, Afri Forum's submission to Parliament. I'm not sure that uh, they offered much constructive in the way of alternative proposals on land reform, but what they did do quite effectively, I thought, was give the ANC and the EFF a much-needed tongue-lashing on the National Democratic Revolution, you know, good for them for doing that. I fully agree with you there. And actually, I think one of the, the things that I was happy to hear when Adam Sturutz uh, gave his presentation at the committee was he mentioned the National Democratic Revolution. And I think this is something which is not emphasized enough. Um, so look, I mean, I, I personally, I was disappointed very much with the response of MPs, uh, including, I'm afraid to say, one DA MP. And I'd like to make it clear, I don't hold you responsible for what your colleagues say. I think that's uh, really unfair. But again, when we hear things like this and we have to look at a ballot paper and it doesn't say Michael Cardo, it says DA, Democratic Alliance, we are forced to vote one way or another. And this is, you know, why I, I talk about the land issue, which is, in my opinion, it's just so vital. It should really be taking center stage. Um, Absolutely, it's foundational. Look, I mean, I can't speak on behalf of my colleague. You know, for all I know, something may have transpired in the committee uh, that led um, the individual, I'm not sure who it was, um, to form a particular opinion. So, you know, I, I say that not having actually sat in the committee itself. Um, but that was my, my broad impression. But I really want to put to rest this notion that DA is kind of soft peddling or pussyfooting around the land issue, because it isn't. Um, it takes the land issue extremely seriously. It recognizes just how pivotal 
foundational and essential property rights are to our constitutional dispensation, to the future of constitutional democracy, and it will do everything within its power to fight what is essentially a joint project uh, of the ANC and the EFF to undermine that settlement. Well, I'm very happy to, to hear that from a member of parliament from the DA. You know, it's funny, I always seem to watch the press releases and the stuff which is shown to the public and become a little bit disillusioned. And then I actually talk to one of you guys and immediately I, I turn around. It's, it's a very interesting cycle that always goes on. A little while ago... <laughs> Glad to hear it. Yeah, yeah, no, for sure. I mean, a little while ago I spoke to your colleague, Zach Mbele, a really great guy, and we had a similar chat. And uh, So, so I don't know. Perhaps, perhaps the media is not uh, treating you guys uh, well enough. I know there was a thing with the ANC, uh, with the SABC rather. Um, but but all, all I'd say from from my side, I think we're we're getting to the end of our points here, is just that you know I think this land issue is just extraordinarily uh, important. It's the thing I'm go personally going to be voting on next year, and uh, I'm glad to hear the DA is fully behind property rights. So. Let me end off just by asking you uh, to do a pitch for your party. If you're a, a classical liberal, uh, why vote DA? Why vote DA? Oh, I would say that the DA is the only party to bring about the change South Africa needs because uh, we have a policy platform that will grow the economy and create jobs. It's the only party that truly believes in one South Africa for all. It's the only party that is genuinely multiracial and non-racial in aspiration. You know, ANC likes to talk the language of non-racialism, but the fact is that it gave up on that project years ago, if indeed it was ever actually reconcilable with African nationalism itself, which I highly doubt. And the DA is the only other party with a proven track record in government, in municipal government and provincial government, and I think one must be cognizant of the importance of the election next year. Um, the ANC has been in power for 25 years now. It has absolutely brought us to the brink. The Zuma years were a total disaster, utterly ruinous. Um, we are under a very big misapprehension if we think that Cyril Ramaphosa is going to be able to make a significant dent on any of that, because his hands are tied, nothing is going to change. The ANC is absolutely rotten to the core. Uh, all this talk of self-correction and rejuvenation is rubbish. And the only thing that might rejuvenate the ANC is a salutary spell of the opposition benches, all of which is to say that now more than ever before, it is very important to vote for an alternative that can undo the damage or start to undo the damage that the ANC has inflicted upon us for 25 years. And never before has the time been this right. Uh, it's the first real opportunity that we have in a national election to substantially weaken the ANC's hold on power. If I'm not mistaken, uh, the Institute of Race Relations conducted a poll last week showing the ANC sitting around 52%. I mean, it's, it's never been that close uh, in its electoral history to the 50% uh, mark. So I would vote for the DEA because um, we have this proven track record in government. We have a vision for the future that brings people together, uh, doesn't drive them apart, as the ANC is currently doing. And so we need to defeat the ANC in, in Gauteng, in the Northern Cape, to retain the Western Cape, and substantially weaken them nationally. Because if we don't vote for the DA, then we are going to subject ourselves to however many more years of disastrous financial and economic mismanagement, higher unemployment, and worsening education outcomes, and more and more entrenched and institutionalized corruption in the public sector. It's time to put a stop to that and to vote for total change for the DA. 
On that note, uh, thank you very much for chatting to me on the Rational Standard podcast. It's been a pleasure. I wish you all the best of luck for next year's election. I'll be honest, I'm not 100% sure who I'm voting for, just to give you a complete honesty. But uh, but as usual, I think you make a good case. And I'm very happy to... I'll, 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 I'll have to persuade you uh, another time again. Well, no. uh, you know, you've still got a few months, so don't worry about it. <laughs> <laughs> it was great chatting to you, Nick. Thanks so much for having me as a guest on your show. No problem. Thanks very much for coming on to the show. Keep well on that side. Cheers. Thanks so much. Cheers. Thanks for listening to another episode of the Rational Standard Podcast. You can find our articles at www.rationalstandard.com. Give us a like on Facebook and subscribe to our podcast on iTunes or listen to the episodes online at PIPA. In addition to that, you can join our mailing list at rationalstandard.com or you can find me on Twitter at Nick Babaya or at Rational Stand. Stay tuned for the next episode.